um, Okay. Okay. Prenanda, Croizui Kravavod, the Aki Kigit Amdod. Okay. Can I ask if we had uh, any apologies for absence? No apologies have been received, Chair. Okay. Just coming on that, I, I think Councillor Lee Davis um, is in another meeting. There was a little bit of a mix up between star times on this. Um, I think he's hoping to come in uh, a little bit later in the, in the meeting. Um, declarations of interest. Member, agenda item number two. Members are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and prejudicial interest in respect of matters contained in this agenda in accordance with the provisions of the Local Government and Finance Act 1992 relating to council tax, the Local Government Act 2000, the council's constitution and the members' code of conduct. Okay, agenda item number three, um, envi environmental enforcement across the county borough. Um, and I believe this is going to be presented by Paul Jones and Gemma Price. If one of you would like to come in. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, councillor. Um, yeah, just, just to quickly summarise, um, I'm led to believe that there's two reports going on this afternoon for enforcement. So just to quickly summarise on both of them, and obviously open for questions. Uh, starting with the flight tipping enforcement report, uh, evidence shows to date this year, compared to last year, there has been an increase of 161 complaints up to quarter three. We were requested to provide figures for this report over the Christmas period. Whilst the two weeks over Christmas was slightly up, January has increased a lot from 18 on average to 37 over the weeks. To date, we've had 111 complaints uh, from January the 1st of this year. COVID-19 has obviously impacted with staff shielding, reducing our capacity by 50%, hence there's a slight rise in collection times. We also increased workloads uh, now due to uh, right into private landowners, and we're about to start uh, cleaning unregistered land with help from probation. Moving on to the unregistered land report. It is the local authority's intention to trial so, removing... So, so, sorry to interrupt, Chair, but we got two specific reports. Are we able to deal with the one first before going into the... I understand that they overlap, but it's going to confuse members if we, we're having to go from one report to the other. Yeah. Uh, cause I, I, for example, got questions on both of them. Yeah. So I, I think what we'll do instead of uh, letting Paul go through the, the, the whole report on this one, because I think members should have, uh, will have read it. I think if we just open it up for questions and if we do try and keep it to the envi environmental enforcement across the, the, uh, the county borough and then deal with the, the other one uh, as the last report. So what I'll do first is I'll open it up for members. If, uh, if anyone has got a question, can you raise your hand? Um, Clive Jones. Thank you, Jay. Um, can, Paul, can we have a look at um, uh, 4.2 under the uh, key indi indicators? Uh, you refer there to um, two members of staff, three and a half days per week. Um, are these staff members part time or full time? Um, so, could you explain? exactly how many hours each member of staff works? Uh, I, I Councillor, just to come in there, um, 4.2 is uh, relating to where we were, so that was previously before the environmental cleansing and enforcement team took over. Um, oh, so yeah. uh, we've currently got two members of staff that work full time, however, one is currently um, shielding due to government guidance. Right. Um, so both members of staff, when they're in work, they're full time. Yeah, um, we've got two full time members of staff. But as I said, um, one of our um, 
staff members at the moment are currently off shielding, so we're down to one at the moment. Right. And if we go on to page seven, where you refer to a number of figures there, but the number of uh, fly tipping reports, um, we, we, we haven't got, I don't think every, you know, we haven't got a run up of figures, perhaps going back three or four years where we can see the, the trend. But am I right in saying, um, Paul and Gemma, that the number of reports you are getting is is increasing and has been increasing and has it again increased so far this year? Yes, uh, Councillor Jones, yes. Um, although it fluctuates from month to month, um, I think you're correct in, in what you're saying. Over the years, it has increased slowly but uh, surely. You, you might, for example, have a quarter where it's the figures have gone down compared to the previous quarter, but over the year, over a 12 month, from what I remember and seeing the figures uh, previously, the figures are on the increase. Yes, that's correct. So, with two members of staff who obviously have to have uh, in terms of the holidays, sickness or training with the existing staff for um, X amount of time in the, in the year, we're going to have one member of staff there um, doing this, this work. Um, and currently you've got that problem because unfortunately one of the members of staff is shielded in and I presume has been shielded in for quite some time. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, uh, one of our members of staff is uh, has had the shield on first of all from March on government advice and the more recent advice that we've received. Uh, and also, yes, uh, whenever a member of staff goes off, whether it be sick training or for whatever reason, uh, we don't have a budget to replace them. No. There's, there's, in effect, there's, there is no cover. Um, can I go on then to page eight, six point, uh, five point one five? As you know, Paul, this is a subject very close to my heart, private land, as it is, I would have thought, most of the elected members. Um, you've also, as, as well as, as investigating flight tipping, uh, making arrangements uh, for the staff to um, do their work. You and Gemma are having to deal with issues where there's been complaints, but not only from elected members, but by members of the public um, about the amount of flight tipping and, and litter, etc. And we can give countless examples to go in through the company better. Um, do you, do, you, do you know how many cases you, you have to deal with on private land? Uh, and can you confirm that there is legislation which covers officers to cover this, to, to, to deal with this, both in the Environmental Health Department and in planning? But it's really um, making getting officers to agree to enact that legislation? Um, I, I don't know the figure, I, I haven't got the figure to hand at how many we've had for um, private land, but it is, I think there's a figure that we could get. There is legislation available allowing us to deal with um, private land, but it's not always straightforward. So it's not necessarily a, um, a reluctance from other teams to take, to take action. It's just that sometimes the legislation that is available to us doesn't necessarily fit for specific cases. So each case, as it says in the report, each case needs to be taken on its own merit to see which piece of legislation would be, if any, would be um, available for us to, to use to take a case forward. Uh, and is it possible um, through the chair, if, if all the members of this committee can be supplied with the number of cases that you are 
I've received complaints with and are having to be involved um, on private land um, because the other thing is that the ones that are pursued, uh, you have to write to the owners. And uh, my understanding is, unless you take them to court, my experience is very little, uh, in most cases, nothing is done about it. Are you there? Can I also ask the officers when you're answering to turn their uh, camera on, please? Yeah, in terms of um, in terms of the private land cases, yeah, we you know again, uh, that's something that's increasing year on year. Uh, but as in previous years, we never used to write to land a uh, private landowners. It's something that we've only done in the last twelve months. Um, we haven't prepared anything because I didn't know this question would be asked in terms of how many we deal with. Uh, we did we did prepare for unregistered land, and that was 26 complaints since April of this year. Uh, however, I, I will look to get the information you, you've asked for, Clive, and um, it's it's a tricky one to be honest. With you. As as you've already alluded to, you know there, there are various elements of legislation required to write to certain individuals. Um, on the crux of it, we, we've had quite a bit of success, to be honest. Um, but again, there are individuals that would uh, prefer to ignore uh, a letter from the council. Uh, and we are, we're having continuing issues with them. So as I, as, I, as I said, you know, um, it's something that ourselves planning and public health deal with. Uh, and, and it is a problem, but it's something that we never used to deal with before. It's, ju it's just an added burden, which, you know, we're doing our best with. And I, I'm well aware, um, Paul and Gemma, that it is a, an added burden with a very small section dealing with this fundamental issue but do you agree that there is frustration all around, not only with the elected members, but with the public, when we have areas of land slap bang next to it or private land, be it private land or unregistered land, sticking with private land at the moment, and trying to explain, and I suppose you had to try and explain to um, residents that we can clear the area on public land but we can't clear the area on private land and if we do pursue that um, we have to use specific legislation and right to the old you know um, I wouldn't have thought that we've had many cases where we've taken private owners to court which is the only language some of them understand Yeah, that's that's correct, uh, Councillor Jones. Um, it it is. Uh, I think what what we need to understand from 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 my team's perspective, anyway, is Gemma is the only environmental health officer within the team. Um, we're, we're inundated with. Uh, I, I know they they deemed as complaints, but the vast majority are members of the public requesting a clear up, which I don't really see as a complaint as such. Uh, our, our schedules and our collection times are really good and one of the top in Wales. Um, but yeah, pri private land, uh, there's so much behind right into people. You know, you've got to do your land searches, you've got to do the, the legal letter. You don't always get a response. It's like when we do interviews for fly tipping, you know, they're allowed three occasions before they come in. And that can take weeks before, you know, with letters going back and forth and everything else. It's a very difficult job for one officer. And, you know, really speaking, we, if you we want to improve this service, you need to put more resources into it. Yeah. And would you agree that we need to use the available legislation that is there, um, use all, all of that? Um, because th and there may be more, 
But the ones I know about are the Environmental Protection Act of 1990 and the Planning Act at Section 215, because I've asked officers to use in both the Environmental Health Department and yourselves and planning to use it. And they, they have used it. But um, my understanding is, frankly, the whole of your section every day are up to their necks dealing with all these issues and trying to untangle them and get the work done. Yeah, I appreciate those comments, Councillor. Um, you know, it, it is a very difficult job. It's on the increase. It's a corporate priority. And to be honest, with you, we are drowning, but we're doing the best we possibly can. Um, and I got uh, two last questions, uh, Chair. On, still on page eight, eight uh, 5.17. Um, and as you as you know, Paul, I, I've had correspondence with you with a particular case uh, in my ward. And I, I'm pleased to see that uh, on this occasion, probation are going to be involved and, and, and you're working with them. Um, you say that the works will take around eight weeks to complete, um, hopefully started in, in February. Um, and you talk about waste signs there. Um, do, you, do you mean the, 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 the signs that are placed in a number of areas um, to tell people that if you drop lit, lit a year or fly tip, you label the prosecution. Are you talking about those signs or are you talking about any signs? Um, sorry. It's about clearing forward from any signage as well as putting out new signage in problematic areas. Paul, you're you're Paul, you're muted. Apologies. Yeah, uh, we've had to work with uh, our legal team uh, regarding unregistered land, and Simon has kindly provided us with the information we required. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, um, before we can enter the land, because it's unregistered, that doesn't mean that it, it isn't owned. So we need to put a notice on the land uh, for 21 days, basically uh, advising people that, you know, the, the the area in question is causing us a problem with fly tip and litter, etc. cetera. Uh, we, we intend um, to remove the waste. And if anybody, you know, does own the land or has any uh, acquaintances with the land, they need to write to us and let us know. Um, but as I said, it's a legal obligation to put the sign up and there will also be a plan attached to the sign. And then we'll, we'll basically come along in 21 days, three weeks, and we'll do a removal of the site and look also to put some signage up after we leave and, if possible, uh, restrict access to the area. Yes, and your last point there would be very helpful if some sort of barrier or fencing can be put up to stop these and signposting clearly that you know, regular signs we see everywhere where there's problems, uh, warning the public that if anybody dumps there, they are liable to prosecution. So you hope to put that sign up. But the probation people would clear the foliage here, put that sign up, and then you give what did you say two to three weeks to see if anybody comes back? And if nobody comes back, then you clear it up. Yeah, basically the sign will go up um, imminently. Uh, we'll have to give it 21 days then for someone to respond. Uh, and then after three weeks, obviously we've, we've got um, a list of 10 locations at the moment unregistered. So the signs will all go up the same week. And then three weeks later, we'll come along We'll remove all the waste and we'll tidy up the area with uh, streamers, etc. And hopefully then we can put a fly tip and sign up then and, and maybe restrict the access to the areas. And thank you. And on the same page, right on the bottom, under the heading, what we need to do next. 7.2, you, you refer to looking at restricting access to hotspot areas. Um, you've just mentioned it. Is that what you mean by hotspot areas 
or, or more specific hotspot areas. And does that mean that you put barriers up, fence in, etc., to get them to stop them dumping on on particular areas? Yeah, we we have got a list currently. Um, to be honest, though, we've got something like sixty-five hotspot areas throughout the county. Better, um, some are more um, problematic than others, uh, so we prioritise them accordingly. Um, and we we have looked. You know, there there are certain places around the county, better, especially the town road, where we've we'd like to put. Uh, a restricted access barrier or, or whether it be boulders, etc. So far to date, we've we've had quite a few stumbling blocks um, in terms of highways legislation, uh, engineers issues, um, rights of way, you name it, we, we've pretty much hit it. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna pursue that, you know, we're gonna keep going and hopefully uh, at some point someone will break and we and we'll get away with what we're trying to do. Yeah, and um, <laughs> I don't make any excuse for referring to this, it's down there, but under 7.3 and page 8, you've got continue to distribute and deploy dummy cameras, which is wonderful, but um, I'm sure both you and Gemma know what I'm going to say next, and frankly, the only alternative is to have proper cameras picking up people, gathering the evidence, taking them to court, prosecuting as many as we can, and it's then the message will go out. But I understand that we've got hardly very few cameras working in any part of the county borough, and there lies a major problem with all the work that you and Gemma and the staff are doing at the end of the day you have to have the evidence, and there's nothing better than having CCTV image and showing it to the magistrates, because there then, in my view, in most cases, is an open and shut case. So dummy cameras are one thing. The real cameras is the one thing that we should be definitely be doing. But there seems to be a, a bit of a, I don't know, um, an issue about that or reluctance, because we talked about uh, the Reveda cameras um, a, a long time ago, which Murtha Valley Homes have got and are working, but, and we found out what the real cost of that was five and a half thousand pounds plus VAT, but it's ended up in a cul-de-sac at the moment. Okay, we we'll stay on questions, I think. Uh, Malcolm? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just for a point of clarity, does the common count as unregistered land or as private land? The common is actually owned, so no, that doesn't come under the un unregistered land. So if, if that's private land, have we ever written to the Commoners Association asking them to clear any rubbish that's on their land? We actually work quite closely with um, the owner of the common. Um, we are currently in a working group with them, um, so we we are trying to work together to try and put measures in place to reduce the amount of fly tipping on the common. Um, so yeah, we have spoken to and we do speak to them on a quarterly basis at the moment, um, but unfortunately, unless we put other measures in place to try and deal with the common, it's going to just keep recurring. So we are working quite closely with them to try and come up with other um, other ways to to reduce the areas in which fly tipping can occur. Right, thank you for that. But is there any prospect of getting the fly tipping that's already on the common removed? Um, well, the, there's, we've got a ranger that I think, uh, Paul might have to correct me, I think he's employed part-time by Merthyr Council. Um, he clears some areas, but in relation to the rest of the areas, and I, unless we restrict access to the common by, via vehicle, obviously you can walk, still walk there and things, but unless we restrict access, I don't think the, um, the waste is going to reduce. Yeah, I think the common is so big, there's no way you could restrict access 
to all of it because people just drive off road onto the common to uh, to dump it. So I don't I don't see how that that you know restricting access would help. Just sorry, just to jump in there. Um, I've had a recent conversation with the the warden on the common, and they've had um, they've had a little bit of grant funding where they're going to employ somebody uh, as an enforcement officer on the common uh, on a three day week. Uh, for at what period of time I don't know, but Mark is um, confident that this person is going to be driving around and issuing FPNs for anybody he catches, which should in itself be a, a very good deterrent. Yeah, I, but I agree. But they've also well, got. Sorry, just sorry, to sorry, add to that, yeah. we've all, they've also got um, pro, a project uh, that they're undertaking at the moment where they are trying to sort of. Build, um, dig trenches and things like that to restrict people from being able to drive on to the common. So it, there's, it's not just sort of barriers and things like that. There's other uh, plans in motion to try and restrict access to the common. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen the uh, trenches and, and they're a good idea where they are. But as I say the, the common is so big, we're not going to be able to, you know, do that around the, the whole of the area. Um, having a, an enforcement officer issuing FPNs is great if he can catch anybody doing it. But my thoughts is it tends to happen after dark when there's unlikely to be an enforcement officer around. Okay, anybody else? Malcolm, you got any other questions? Um, yeah, someone's just put a message in on that. Um, but, uh, from David I Jones. can answer that because I'm on the committee. It's for the, all the common, Dave. It's for the Rumby Park and the Mercer Park. So the grant was for £250,000. And it's for a year it is for to cover the Ranger and other work. So, yeah. Does that start, has it started, that project get died, do you know? Or does it start in April? Well, they, they only had the grant. I think it's starting in the beginning of March, it is. They, they carrying on. The, the original contract they had, but as an extension given by the Welsh office, uh, the Welsh government to carry on another year. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks all. Right, thank you for that, David, as well. Mark, can you finish there? Jeremy, I think you got some questions. Yes, the two do and registered land. Do, do you know now you're saying um, you're going to start clearing there? Obviously, some community groups, as you know, worked in the community. Lit, uh, lit the picking or picking up fly tipping, but obviously before we wouldn't do it on private land or registered land, especially private land, obviously because you can get done by trespassing. But on on the unregistered land, we we weren't allowed to pick it up or anything because the council wouldn't pick it up. Is that sort of going to change now? Obviously, it don't affect me as much in the green as most of the land is owned. But um, I'm just thinking for other community groups I volunteer with. Yeah, um, just just to update you, uh, as much as I know at this moment in time, um, our chief officer and our portfolio member met. Uh, we, we put a, a, a small report together for them to discuss. Um, basically, we're looking at doing a 10-week trial period of entering onto unregistered land and removing the waste. Is that it, Chair? Yeah. Uh, Councillor David Jones. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, at 6.0, it says we would like to, like to significantly reduce instances of flight tipping within the county borough. In my opinion, it is just that. In many cases, flight tipping begins at residence gardens, and this can be seen just by driving around our streets. Waste is sometimes left in gardens for weeks. When wardens are on the streets, do they note properties that have waste in their gardens and what that waste is? And I'll leave it at that for a second. Yeah, in terms of um, answering your questions, uh, Councillor Jones on waste wardens, that doesn't come under um, my area. That's uh, waste services. Uh, I have, I have um, myself spoke to Steve and Paul, the two managers, and. I know the wardens go around and they put in excess tape on bags that uh, in places they shouldn't be. 
uh, in terms of their legislation and whether they're enforcing, I, I can't really answer that. But as far, just sorry, just to add to that, as far as I'm aware, they can only um, enforce when waste has been. Jay, if you want to continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just actually along those uh, lines. Uh, um, are we working with registered social landlords and private landlords to, to address this issue? We work, um, we work quite closely, we still work closely with Merth Valley Homes. Um, they, they, because they've got such a large housing stock, they tend to be the, the ones we need to deal with the most, to be honest. So yeah, we're still working closely with them and we will liaise with Merth Housing Association as well. Which is good, good to hear. Um, on the point then of probation services, do the probationers involved need any special training? Um, uh, or do they require special PPE? And how will they get to and from sites with regard to COVID regs? Yeah, we've um, we've actually had one meeting with the probation service and spoke to the the regional manager. Uh, in a nutshell, they basically uh, they come along and we have to provide uh, any equipment that they require to do the job. They've got a supervisor uh, on a ratio of seven to one, and they'll they'll be basically asking us for all the bags, uh, use of streamer equipment, litter pickers, uh, etc. And we we'll also need to find a budget then. Uh, Having spoken to the waste services manager, he would prefer prefer sorry the waste to be collected via skips. So you know they're not um, traveling in and out to the HWRC sites daily, uh, and to contain all the waste in the skip was probably the best way forward for us. And we can also look at any any of the waste being recycled. Yeah, and they, and then also just. Sorry, just to add to that, they are um, responsible for making their own way to the sites. Um, we, that's a question we did ask when we had the meeting with probation, so they'll have to um, make their own way there. Right. Um, can you give an idea of the number of successful prosecutions you've had and where this ranks against other local authorities in Wales? Um. Obviously, this year uh, we wouldn't be able to produce that yet until year end. However, um, last year um, I'm pleased to say that uh, in terms of a ratio of um, prosecutions per officer per council, uh, Gemma was one of the top performing officers throughout the Ulu Wales. Uh, she was in the, the top five. Um, but as I said, and as you can imagine, uh, lots of other authorities got the same issues as us and um, they've got a lot more officers because we are obviously the smallest uh, authority in Wales. But uh, yeah, in terms of officer ratio, which is something that we questioned um, Welsh Government on, uh, we didn't feel that we were getting um, the true figures for what we were doing as an authority. So Swansea might have had 20 prosecutions last year. But what they weren't telling you was they had five officers, five environmental health officers. Well, Gemma last year had 10 successful prosecutions and she was the only officer for the Ulamur So that was that was very pleasing and um, uh, re really good, actually. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with that. Um, perhaps Gemma needs some, some uh, support in her role. Uh, my final point is, again, considering how small the enforcement team is, am I correct that this team has been promoted across Wales as an example of best practice? Yeah. Good, um, good practice, at least. Yeah. Out of the blue, I had, a, I had an email Friday from um, a company who works for Welsh Government, a uh, communication company who uh, were dealing with Flight Tip and Action Wales. And they actually asked if they could uh, use use us um, for uh, an impending press release. 
because of all the successful prosecutions we had last year. And um, I've uh, spoke to the chief officer and the portfolio uh, member, and we've we well our press release will be released next week. Great to hear, and glad you know glad to hear that uh, your hard work is being recognised elsewhere. Thank you, Chair. Did anybody ask any questions, Malcolm? Did you want to come in, Norm? No. Clive, is that a legacy? Uh, no, no, Chair. Um, right. I've just, I've got a couple of questions. I've got three, two questions. Yeah, actually. yeah, I, I, yeah I got. Um, you are. To follow, sorry to follow up my point about the uh, deploy the dummy cameras. Um, I made a point there about uh, you know, using the real cameras. Um, does either Paul or Gemma have any answers to that? I um, I have caught up with our uh, from a, I think it was our last meeting. Uh, you questioned uh, why we're not using the Ravada, um, and I have I have caught up with our community safety team to have a discussion about the one they use. Uh, there's a there's a few issues with the Ravada. Um, I know that uh, Merthyr Valley Homes are promoting it and saying it's a great piece of kit. However, there's always a but. Sorry. Um, I spoke to Ryan Evans, who's the team leader in community safety, and whilst we have one, uh, he's having major issues with the 4G signal. And uh, you're only you're only submitted so much data per month, and if you're actually using the camera for its purpose of catching people, you basically got to download the data, and it's very very costly. And um, the, the other issue he's had is he said it's just not practical for what they are using it for. Well, the flip side of that is Merthyr Valley Homes. I've spoken to officers there as well, and, and they think the best part of the kit itself is, is the fact that it's a deterrent, and wherever they put in it, it's stopping fly tipping. So in terms of prosecutions, no, they're not getting anything out of it, but but as a, as a camera itself, it, it is a, it's very good as a deterrent. But as we've proved in the past, the deterrent is one thing. Uh, there are individuals, groups out there who will do anything to save money by dumping their rubbish, etc., where they shouldn't. And I'm firmly convinced that you know, at the end of the day, we need to be prosecuting these people, taking them to court, because Having dummy cameras here, there, and everywhere is one thing, but you know, um, solid evidence in the court with the prosecution is the best deterrent, in my view, that you probably can ever come across. Yeah, I I wouldn't deny that, uh, Councillor Jones. Um, it's something that I, I I bring up with my chief officer, and we'll have a discussion over. Uh, what we find though a lot of, um, certainly lately, we get a lot of people who complain about fly tipping and will write in and, and phone us and, and everything else. But when we actually ask them for a statement to go to court, so you know we go so far and then we need that statement to go to court, people are reluctant to to, to be a witness basically, and and that unfortunately. Gemma can be halfway through a case and, and people are pulling out uh, for the fear of repercussions. Yeah, yeah, I understand that uh, they can always be those difficulties. Um, right, I think that's, well, yes, I just wanted to clarify, um, Chair, um, in, in respect to these cameras, because we have debated it. 18 months ago, are we, are you, is it the intention of the officers to come back to this scrutiny committee at some time about the whole issue of whether we're going to engage some of these live cameras or not? Uh, I'm going to be honest, Councillor Jones, without the extra resources, there's no chance of us ever putting any cameras up. 
they're, they're very resource intensive. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I've done them myself in, in, initially in the beginning. You, you've got to go out somewhere along four or five o'clock in the morning. You've got to stake out the area you're going to use, use it in. Um, the cameras we currently got are battery operated and dependent on the amount of activity in the area. They, they, they can burn out after 24 hours. Um, now, to get somebody to go out at four o'clock in the morning every 24 hours is going to impact on their daily work routines immensely. Um, and as we've already alluded to, we've got one operative at the moment working in flight tipping. So cameras for the foreseeable future, unless there's extra resources, is not going to happen. Right. And can I clarify, Chair, that the uh, report on unregistered land, are we going to deal with separately after this one? Because we, we've crossed over uh, on it. I was going to suggest that, uh, Clive, to be honest, um, I think I'll have to get clarification from uh, Maria if uh, if we if we can do that change change the um, ch change uh, where it comes in, in the uh, in, in the in, in during this meeting. Um, so I'll, I'll ask at the end. I've got a couple of questions on this one first. I'll ask at the end. Um, Clive, you finish your questions. Yeah. Um, in 3.1 of the report, um, it, it says that uh, according to Keep Britain Tidy, local authorities in the UK recorded in excess of 1 million incidents of flight tipping, costing over 50 million of taxpayers' money to clear, clear off council land. Do you have any figures for how much it costs Mercer Tidville County Borough Council every year to, to, uh, to clear um, flight tipping off, uh, off, off council land? It's not a figure I've got to hand. I don't know whether it's something maybe Paul could. Um, I I don't know if we count our waste as separate, if that makes sense. So I, is, I don't know if it's something the accountants can run a report on. Yeah, that. Um, yeah, that's something I'd have to speak to the accountant on. You know, if you want it as specific uh, tonnages, etc. Um, I haven't got that information to hand, but it's certainly something I can get. I, I think, to be honest, it, it might be handy for all members because obviously, this this there's a budget set aside for this. We're using money that could be that could go into um, education, uh, the education budget, social services budget, even take money off council tax. And I, th I think, to be honest, if if people knew how much we were spending, I think they'd have less time for the people that are flight tipping. Sometimes people turn a blind eye to these people, just think they're rogues or, or whatever. But if they actually knew the true cost, I, I think they'd, um, I, I think uh, people would be less inclined to um, to uh, to give them the benefit of the doubt and just, uh, so if you can get the, those figures and send them to the committee, it would be great. Um, my other question then, uh, Councillor David Jones has touched on it. We were having regular um, regular figures for for uh, prosecutions and and going to court and that sort of thing. Obviously, it's a little bit different during during uh, the coronavirus pandemic. You, there's been no court date set for for well nearly twelve months, I presume. Um, but can, can you just would you be able to send the members out on how many prosecutions are are ongoing? Um, obviously, they haven't got the court, but uh, just kind of where you are with them if that's something you could send out to us as well um and then this is a question this was for paul, paul and Gemma. obviously something needs to be done with flight tipping it's it's a blight on on our landscape uh, the amount of money that, that uh, gets spent in it um the well-being that from people as well you know it, it, it affects their well-being uh, seeing all this flight tipping you obviously meet with other officers from different um, uh, different local authorities, and I, I, I presume you get reports uh, sent to you via email from from English uh, councils as well. Is there any councils that are what what you would call best practice that have have got their flight tipping? Um, they've reduced it a lot, and if so, how have they done it?
Um, yeah, we we carried out an exercise last year because um, the same question was was asked by the leader uh, based on you know in terms of best practice, who's doing really well and what are they do, doing differently to us? So Je Gemma went down to Neath Port Talbot to, to meet with them because um, the, their targets had, had, were, well, they were exceptional actually. So when Gemma went down there, they, they, they do a few other different things to us, but what they have got as well is um, f what come back to me then as being a, a more positive uh, look upon it. They've got enforcement officers, and they got they actually got officers that are assigned to go out to fly tipping, check it, check the evidence, um, local knowledge of, of of the rogues, if you like, who, who live locally and everything else. Um, they do deploy cameras, uh, but what they do do, and they do it very well apparently, is they liaise with the police force, and the police are very proactive in in helping these Port Albert. Um, but what we've got in comparison is we haven't got any um, assigned enforcement officers. What we've got is is two men, which we call an it squad, who, who basically, and they're up to their neck in it. They, they go around to all the complaints that we receive and they look for evidence. And, and that's basically their job. And that's what's taking them all week to do. So the evidence we get then is, is brought back to Gemma who, who is the only working officer within our team who, who has to deal with all the evidence. And, and as you alluded to earlier, you know, there is a lot of evidence within the office, yeah? And the workload is just too much for one officer. But with, as I said, you know, I've stated earlier, she did very well last year in getting 10 prosecutions. Uh, we, we lost one. Um, we lost one in court. But... 10 prosecutions in a year for one officer is is an excellent return in terms of the west, the rest of what Wales are doing. So in terms of best practice, we're doing well. Um, but there are, without the shadow of a doubt, you know, there are authorities, they're doing it differently to us and, and we need to learn from them as well. Okay, thank you, Paul. Malcolm? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm really pleased to hear that we're doing so well in, in terms of the number of prosecutions pro rata to the size of the authority and the number of staff that we've got. Um, are we taking the maximum opportunity to publicise our successful prosecutions and getting the message out via uh, social media channels and the council website, etc.? Because that is one thing that people really look for. Um, and I think, you know, are, are they all getting out there? Yeah, all, all our prosecutions are, are go out via uh, our comms team um, and we've had good feedback, to be honest. Um, we, we, we are, we're also um, liaising with Flight Tip and Action Wales and, and all their communications go out via our comms team in Merthyr. So, yeah, we, we, we're doing a lot in terms of communications. Uh, but uh, again, you know, we, we could be doing more again, I suppose. Any more, Malcolm? No, no just uh, just one point. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Councillor, Councillor David Jones. Thank you, Chair. Is it possible for I? I would certainly like to be kept up date, up to a date with um, with prosecutions, whether it's six monthly, annually. Uh, I don't know how other members of this committee or other councillors feel, but I think I would like to promote that as well. Yeah, if we add that to the actions and, and right to the end, if we'll ask Maria to um, to, to contact Paula, Paula uh, and Gemma via email to ask if uh, we could have updates every every six months, maybe just maybe even just a written report and and we're in, and then it'd be up to members after that if uh, they want Paul Paul and Gemma to come back and uh, uh, answer questions on it. But we'll certainly raise that later on, uh, Di. Yeah, happy to have just the information share rather than a, a further report. Yeah, Grant, lovely. Um, okay, any anyone else got any questions? Any comments, Clive? It's um, clearly we've got a a small section here 
that are, in my view, from everything we've heard, a success for school committees punching above their weight. Um, I, I think that um, I, for one, um, want to thank them for all the work they're doing from day to day. Um, and I've no doubt that, uh, you know, when you, you see emails from not only the residents of the public, but, but the councillors, um, it, it's something that we need to do as elected members. But when you've got a small section there, there's only so many hours in the working day. So I think we've got to take that into account, uh, to be frank with you. Um, so, although it's, I get frustrated with perhaps not being able to get things sorted out um, as the public would want straight away, um, there are reasons for it. And um, I, I can only uh, compliment all the staff involved and say keep up the good work. Um, but clearly, you need more help and support. If we go into to, to do things perhaps quicker and deal with things uh, perhaps as hopefully we all think we sh should happen. And can I clarify? Are we going on to item six straight after this, Jay? I say I'll ask permission. I'll yeah. finish this one and I'll ask okay. Marie if we're allowed to do it or okay. democratic. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else got any comments? Okay. Um, Maria Pernell, or someone in the, the Democratic Department, can you confirm if we're allowed to bring uh, agenda item number six, the flight to bin on unregistered land forward and discuss it next? Because we have been dipping in and out of it. And I think a lot of the questions will have been the same or will be the same. There, may, there, there will be some, uh, some extra, but um, it just may be easier for, as, Paul and, Paul, as Paul and Gemma I've been answering questions. Everything is fresh in the mind of, of members, if it's OK. From my perspective, Chair, yeah, it makes perfect sense as long as the committee are comfortable with the shift. Okay. And it does seem to be a synergy between the two items. Yeah. Has any, anyone got any objections? No? Lovely. Um, we'll go on to item agenda number six, then. is flight tipping uh, on unregistered land. Um, just looking at this, the recommendations are that the contents of this report be debated. But uh, some of the members have asked in the pre-meeting to include a recommendation that the committee vote on which they think is their preferred option. Obviously, it's down to Cabinet, uh, their decision, um, what, what happens. Um, the cabinet decide on this. Um, just to make it clear to, to cabinet member David Hughes, but it's just that some of the um, some of the committee would want to be able to say that this is their their preferred option, um, and, but obviously a yeah, cabinet can make their own decision. So can we include that in the um, in the recommendations? Right, um, Paul and Chairman. I don't think there's any, uh, there's no point in having you go through and read the report. I think members will have read it. Um, everything will be fresh in their mind. So I, I just want to open it straight up to questions, uh, if, if, uh, if that's okay with everyone. And Clive? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, can I take you to paragraph 5.4? where it refers to uh, various things like the amount of residual waste that would be collected could increase, which may have detrimental financial implications on the local authority. Um, if you could explain a bit more about that. Um, it says disposal costs would also need to be taken into consideration. Um, as removing waste from unregistered land would mean more flight tip waste being collected. And then it goes on to re refer to the hazardous waste, i.e. asbestos, uh, needed to be removed, and this is cost costly. So, um, the, let's stick with the, for example, the probation service who we've um, 
in, hope to engage in the next three weeks. Um, you mentioned something about a, perhaps a skip being placed on these sites. So does that mean that the probation people involved would have to, um, if there are various cans, plastics, wood, etc., there, they'd have to um, go through these, um, put them in separate amounts, and then take it up to the up to the site, or would the the skips that be used be taken up to the site, and then the personnel up there? have to excrete um, what is what is what um, and I, I think it's been mentioned somewhere else as well referring to to bottom ash so that the residual waste after we've um, recycled what's left there is then uh, we, we get some a certain amount of money back from the uh, residual waste. I got one or two other questions afterwards, Jane. I think the cabinet member wants to come in. Uh, just to say, skips will be used when there's a large amount of fly tipping. Clive, we won't be using skips when there's a small bit of fly tipping. They, that would be sorted out on site, obviously. It's only when you've got a large amount of fly tipping where it be uh, cost effective to have a skip put there, like uh, we've seen in parts of Merthyr, you know. Thank you for that. Um, and then on 5.5, um, uh, it refers there that since April 2020, we've had 26 inches of waste deposited on unregistered land. Um, I would have thought that my own view that that figure is would be down for this year because possibly of the, the pandemic and people having to stay at home um, and the lockdowns etc but in the next paragraph um, you refer to the figures of 75 to 100 in a one-year period which i would have thought is more like it and may well be more than 100 um, can you um, can you enlarge upon those uh, those figures, please? Yeah, those um, those figures would just have been a projection um, of the current reports we had within a specific amount of time, and then we would have obviously looked to see um, how much that we would have just done a sort of simple um, figure then to see how much that would have been projected estimated over a year so um we were estimating because we'd had around 26 reports we would get in that was in a one quarter so by the time we had a full year then that would have been a um where that figure would have come from right thank you and in connection with that because it's mentioned somewhere else um with these large amounts uh, obviously you don't know what's involved there like it could be asbestos or there could be other hazardous waste. Um, how, how and when is a decision taken to involve the NRW? You know, does somebody look on there and say, well, we think there's a lot of, for example, asbestos waste in there, or we found something else which we know is asbestos, uh, which is uh, really hazardous. So when does it, um, at what stage does it click in to get NRW involved? In our experience, um, when we've tried to engage NRW, um, they haven't uh, they haven't got involved. NRW, I think, will it, NRW is supposed to get involved when it's large scale flight tipping, but I think they are probably victim to um, resource issues the same as we are. Um, so we we don't tend to get the help we we ask for from NRW. So in relation to hazardous waste, I think it would just be down to us to deal with that. Um, the way we deal with that at the moment is by engaging a third party to remove the waste. So I don't think we, we're going to get any help from NRW when it comes to unregistered land. Sorry, um, when you say third party, can you give us an example of what you're talking about? Yeah, we subcontract 
um, asbestos removal to an external company. Right. Okay. But that that's in, in some instances that's because NRW have got staffing issues and resources issues throughout Wales. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Uh, the only time we've actually engaged with our um, subcontractors is when we've had asbestos tipped on our own land. But obviously, if we are taking on the responsibility of unregistered land, then we would have to. Um, engage we couldn't leave it there then so we'd have to engage with the subcontractor to remove the waste and going I, I'm back on page 24 now on 5.2 um, it says if the local authority decides to put a policy in place to deal with unregistered land any waste that removed will be the responsibility of the local authority so Number one, I presume we need to have a policy of dealing with waste and unregistered land. Um, and when you say it's the responsibility of the local authority, um, that's that's everything. Everything we find there, we've got to recycle. Um, other stuff would be residual waste and taken away. Um, is that correct? Yeah, so we, um, as we mentioned previously, we're in the process of writing uh, a flight tipping policy at the moment. So wh whatever decision is made with unregistered land, we would add that into the policy then so that we've got a, you know, we, we know exactly the process and how we deal with unregistered land. Uh, yeah, any waste that if we decide to take on unregistered land, depending on how cabinet want to proceed, then yeah, we would, um, we would then remove any waste that's on our land providing obviously we've done the 21 days notice and no owners come forward etc thank you and would that policy then come back to a cabinet or council or will the draft policy come to a scrutiny committee i i'm led to believe it'll go after the 10-week trial it'll go to the the cabinet for a decision Where that right. sound came from, but it wasn't yeah. just it wasn't hovering in my house. I can show you. Um, can I ask on page 25? Uh, they, they give us two choices there um, one to employ an additional operative, and the second one there is to accept the current resources I use. Let, let's stick with the current resources. Uh, we've just di discussed in some detail. In another report, the uh, the amount of detailed work you're having to undertake day in day out. So, if, for example, this committee or the cabinet decided to ac accept that it should be the current resources are used, is not going to put undue additional pressures on a very small section of staff. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, um, if if we just carry on as we are, we basically got a, a five day window uh, via Welsh data flow and Welsh government uh, regulations to remove waste within five days. Um, we're currently on about 2.2 days per complaint, so it would it would increase the the collection times, no doubt. But I think it would still keep us within the five days, uh, as as you know, um, as as requirements are. But that having said that, you know, we, we've had one person in through through COVID, and he don't look thirty anymore. He looks more like sixty. <laughs> so it's gonna it's gonna impact his uh, his lifestyle definitely. Can I just come in on that one? Uh you said we're currently at 2.2. What would you expect looking at the uh, the current figures for uh, for flight tipping on, on on the land if we were to move it from unregistered land? How many days do you think it'll go to? Two, three, sorry, three, four. Yes, yes. 
it, it's purely a guess dependent because we've only had um, we've only got ten locations at this moment in time. So I wouldn't I wouldn't imagine a massive impact, but it it, it definitely will impact, and I would imagine three to four days. Okay, thank you, Paul. Sorry, Clive. Yes, but um, in the report um, we we indicate in there that this would be um, you know seventy five to one hundred cases you estimated in a year. And that maybe I'll be an underestimate. Yeah, the the 75 to 100 cases, uh, just for you to be aware, the 26 from April were based on 10 locations, but a lot of the complaints were duplicated. But whether they duplicate it, if they from council or group or a member of the public, you you can't ignore that. You have to deal with it, yeah. And and explain the situation to so it it's all connected with everything you've got to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fair point. Um, and as you say, every time we have a complaint, we've got X amount of days to to get there. Um, I don't doubt for whatever reasons, you know, we, most councillors are aware of the, of the hot spot areas in the awards. Certainly, in your case, uh, Councillor Jones, you know. It's an open area, but the grower and it, it, but there, you know, it, it's been added to weekly, daily, and even with a sign up, uh, I've got the feeling that that's not going to improve unless we restrict the access. Yeah, you're absolutely dead right, and I'm sure there will be other instances where you've got to be. And that one is is a good example because it's right, the area is right next door to a busy road. Um, Pavements, and people see, you know, it's in eye view. It's it's lit up. And they'll think, oh, well, people are adding to it, so I'll add it to it. And I'm sure that goes on all over the place. Thank you, Sorry, Jay. Thank you. No more questions. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? Okay. I've I've got a question. Um, this might be one for, for Gemma, or, but it might be Simon Jones illegal as well. Um, as the land is unregistered, um, can the local authority apply to land registry to acquire this land so that money paid out for clearing a flight tip can in some way be balanced out uh, by having an extra parcel of land which will go on the council's uh, um, balance sheet? Uh, David Hughes, cabinet member, wants to come in. That's one of the things that we discussed there when we talked about the unregistered land. If we clear it up off land, the, the land is unregistered. No one comes forward to look at that. <coughs> That's one thing that we will be looking. We have talked to estates and the girls in the states about it, but obviously we haven't had legal representation yet. We haven't spoke to uh, Simon. That's the next stage now. But that have been uh, suggested that we could then try and register the land in the council's name. But obviously we have to take um, guidance of the legal uh, department for that. If I can add, um, I'm not, a, I'm not a, um, a property lawyer, um, so I don't know the answer to that, whether or not we can just simply take land on like that. You know what I mean? It's, um, it seems quite an extreme uh, thing to do. Um, but I'm sure there's somebody within the department that can look at it um, and determine whether or not that's a that's a feasible option. Sorry, I can't give you a an answer though. No, no. Thank you, David, and thank you, Simon. That's uh, for that. I think it's it's definitely an option to uh, to look at. Um, Clive, did you want to come back in? Yes. D um, do we know as an authority how many parcels of land throughout the county borough are unregistered? Surely we must. The state's uh, department would, would have that information, wouldn't they? Yeah, um, if I can answer that. I've uh, requested a re uh, report of the states to look at the unregistered land and if they can come back to me. Um, I only asked last week, so we will have that uh, report and I can share that with this, uh, with this committee. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Uh, any any questions, anyone? Uh, any comments? Clive, I can see you want to. You're on mute. Lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I just think, Chair, that this is hopefully going to be a, a real step forward um, because the frustrations that um, everyone has, including the public, residents of Good Brain, but particularly elected members, where we can clear land on this public land, if there's fly tipping, etc. there, but currently we cannot step onto and clear any fly tipping on unregistered land. Trying to explain that to members of the public, for any councillor, I can assure you, is extremely difficult. Um, and they don't understand why, if, particularly if you've got an area that's next door to each other, you've got a piece of unregistered land, next door to it, we've got um, land that's council land, and in the case of the one I've been pursuing with Paul Jones and, uh, and Gemma, it's exactly that, right next door to it, where this um, pile of, of flight tipping is getting higher every day, right next door to it, is public land where I have um, asked for items to be removed from there. And they've, they have been, but next door to it, it's, it's unregistered land. So this is a problem which is there and we have to crack it. And in my view, here is a suggestion of a way to deal with it because whichever way you look at it, unless we tackle it, it'll be with us here forever and a day and it will take out the frustrations that members of the public and elected members have with the scenario where we've got flight tipping um, that we, we can't deal with and flight tipping on public land that we can deal with. Okay, cabinet member, I think you'd like to come in. Yeah, just uh, say to Clive, I agree wholeheartedly with him. Uh, that's the reason why I, I suggested we bring this report, is because of the difficulty I know yourself and other members have had. Myself and uh, Declan, we've had it loads of times where we, the, some parts of the land have been cleared and less than three foot away is private land and uh, the public can't see that. And uh, I think a clarification needs to be done. And um, it's, that's why the report has been brought, you know. And uh, let's hope that it goes some way on tidying up the, for the residents of Merthyr, because uh, they deserve better, as you said, Clive. Um, and this is just the, the start. I'm sure we can look at other things. Uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, Port Talbot, I know that uh, the probation works closely with uh, Port Talbot Council in the flight tipping. They go out collecting that for uh, Port Talbot and Swansea. So let's hope they can, uh, you know, could they pay him back to society, which they uh, they must. Maybe they can do the business in clean up Mutha. Okay, anybody else? Right, I've got a comment. Oh, David Jones. Yes, thank you, Chair. Obviously, depending on which way this um, water and its report goes, it does seem to indicate that there's money available. Now, throughout both of these reports, most people have commented that uh, the enforcement team should be enforced a bit more, supported a bit more. And I just wonder, depending on which way this goes, if the, if this money could be considered for to support uh, Paul and Gemma. Just a comment, it's not a question. Lovely, thank you, Di. Councillor Malcolm Colbra. Yeah, just a comment for, uh, for Di Hughes. Um, 
I did send you an email regarding this uh, this morning, so hopefully you'll have a chance to look at that and get back to me on that. Okay, anybody else? Okay, I've got a comment. Um, first of all, I, I really want to thank uh, the, the Cabinet member, Councillor David Hughes, for bringing this forward um, to our committee, and then it, uh, it's obviously going to Cabinet. Obviously, um, the Chief Officer, Judith, and to Gemma Price and Paul Jones as well. Um, I think uh, Clive has touched on this. This is something that's a bugbear for residents. Um, we, David and myself have had to deal with it. Lots of meetings um, in regards to King Street in, uh, in Pant as well. And it's finally been cleared um, after a long time. And it's definitely, definitely something we need to go forward with. Um, obviously, there's two options uh, that's... This is not going to affect the cabinet's uh, cabinet's vote in this. This is just uh, one of the members here wanted to bring, w wanted to make sure that uh, that the, the the feeling of the the the, the, uh, the neighbourhood services scrutiny committee um, that their preferred option. Um, I I will I like both options to be honest. Um, the the one thing I would say is that. Just in case, if this does affect our, our KPI figures an awful lot, I think, in my personal opinion, we, it, this is something that should be brought in for maybe 12, 18 months as a, as a trial <laughs> to make sure we don't go, um, uh, it doesn't affect us too much, that doesn't cost us too much money, but obviously you'll think about that in, um, in, in the Cabinet um, meeting. Um, and maybe if you're applying an operative, maybe that the operative could be, a 12 month, 18 month contract, that sort of thing. Um, right, has anyone else got any comments? I know those comments I've just said, Clive and some others won't agree with them, but I think prudence is, uh, is one of the things that uh, we have to look at as well. So Clive? Well, I will move because it's given us two options and a six, uh, 6.2 Roman numeral one or 6.2 Roman numeral two. And it's quite clear um, in there, that there are two options. We've uh, we've heard in, in detail in both items um, what the staff are up against there. Uh, we've been told on more than one occasion in the last few months that there is um, a surplus um, in the um, in the finances. Um, we've had capacity issues uh, here and elsewhere in the authority and um, I would like to move as it's worded there so the recommendations would read 2.1 the contents of the report be debated but it should, I'm moving an amendment to include 2.2 and to employ an additional operative grade 3 approximately 26,528 and a vehicle 655 p.m. plus fewer to allow us to maintain our KPA levels. Yeah. This is just a recommendation that uh, this is the preferred option from uh, from members of the um, uh, of our scrutiny committee. Um, right, we'll go to the vote. If anyone um, would like to abstain, would they raise their hand now? Date, date checks. Chair, Chair, you need to ask for the seconder. Okay. Would someone like to second? Chair, yeah, before you before we go to this, are you going to add the eighteen months in or not? To be honest, Di, this is it'll be a cabinet decision. Yeah. To be honest, I think the cabinet will will make their own mind up. Um, I'm not going to add it in. I'm quite happy to to uh, to leave it the way it is. Um, so unless you'd like to add it in, no, no, leave it no. to you, Chair. Yeah, we'll go as Clive said. Clive is. Uh, Clive has gone for option 6.21 to employ an additional operative, grade three, approximately 26,528 pounds and vehicle to allow us to maintain our, our KPI level. Anyone like to second? Second, Chair. Yeah. Okay, anyone like to abstain? If you raise your hands now. Okay, anyone against? If you raise your hands now. Okay, and all four, if you raise your hands now. 
OK, I think that's unanimous. I think it's uh, obviously it's after the cabinet. They've got to take a, a lot of things into consideration. It's um, uh, it's it's their choice, but uh, this is the, the uh, recommended option from the um, Neighbourhood Services Scrutiny Committee. OK, um, Paul and Gem, I think that's it for yourselves, unless you're staying on for the um, uh, the PSBO thing, but I, I'm not 100 percent sure. So if, if it doesn't affect you, you can you can leave. Um, and if option, uh, if mem if members are okay, we're going to go on to go back to agenda item number four, overview of property services. Jeff, I'm sorry um, to in interrupt you. <coughs> do, do they need or one of them need to stay for the dog fouling <laughs> situation later on? I don't know. The report has actually been taken by um, by by uh, Simon. So. Right. And I, th I think the chief officer here is here as well, and the cabinet members. So I, I don't think they need to, but if uh, if they think they need to stay, I, I, I just wonder. They, they must be having complaints of dog fouling or dealing with it or reporting it. That's all. Only reason I raised it. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to get advice from? Uh, is Judith there? Should Paul Jones and Gemma Price stay? It's not a neighbourhood services report. Um, so I suppose if Simon needs them to comment on anything, but it isn't a neighbourhood services report, so no. Okay, it's lovely. Yeah, I don't. I don't need Paul or Gemma particularly. Um, I think I can answer most of the questions. Lovely. Cheers, Simon. Gemma and Paul, you can go. And thank you very much for uh, for the reports you've um, you've given us today and answering the questions you, that you have as well. Um, thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you. OK, so if we go on to agenda item number four, it's the overview of property services. And I think Chris Jones has joined us. Um, there was a little bit of a mix up in uh, in in um, in uh, invites being sent out. But Chris, you don't have to go through the report. I'm sure members have seen it. So if if uh, if you want, we go straight into questions. Yeah, no problem. Apologise for the uh, delay. Sorry, I was, I was caught in another meeting. So yeah, not not at all. So um, I don't know if, if anyone. Oh, okay, surprise, surprise. Clive. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, could I ask uh, Chris Jones, as the author of this report, because the one thing that, that's not in here um, is a staffing structure. And I think it would be helpful if that had been been in there, because you do refer in the report um, to the staffing situation, and the uh, um, on page, top of page 15, uh, I quote: "Due to budget pressure and efficiency savings, the department has been understaffed for many years, and relied heavily on the assistance of Blaine Gwent." CBC for key major projects and below that you refer to the fact that the team has struggled to hold on to key staff and have lost four technical posts in the last few years. So I for one would really like to see a structure as to what posts are, what they designated and how many vacant posts you've got and where the vacancies are and why they are why they're still vacant? Okay, I can give an over, uh, overview of the, the staff structure. Presently, we have um, seven full-time staff, and we've two and a half agency staff helping out as well. So, under the responsive repairs and strategy maintenance, currently we have a one team leader post, and then we have two technical posts under that. So we've got a team leader who deals with responsive repairs, strategy maintenance, and under him we've got an electrical compliance officer and an asbestos compliance officer. With our energy team, we've got an energy engineer and an energy officer and, and dealing with those. And then we've got the, the project management, which we've got the team leader, which is a vegan post. We've got one building surveyor there and um, two and a half agency posts. I've no doubt you, you you can be able to do that off the top of your head, but I haven't written all those down. Yeah, no. I, don't, I don't intend to. And what I would like, I think, and the whole committee would like, 
is, is a copy of that structure sent to us so that um, we can have a, a good look at it in the cold light of, of day. Um, and on that subject, on, an, on page 15, 5.2, um, I say again, the, the team has struggled a whole lot of key staff and have lost four technical posts in the last few years. And I know that um, you're reasonably new to the authority coming in, Chris. Um, what, has, what have you done in relation to the fact that they've lost four technical posts in the last few years? I, I had a guess these staff have gone to other authorities, maybe to post on a higher salary. Um, it, is there anything that can be done to resolve a situation like that? It's basically the salaries that they've all gone for better salaries. There's, there's a, I think there's two gone to the NHS for better salaries. Um, one's gone private. No, sorry, two have gone private for better salaries. It, it's just driven by better salaries. It's so, so unless we look at that and advertise these posts, because quite clearly, um, per people's individual finances. Um, and the market will we'll determine it. Um, so the, we've got plenty of competition around here. The NHS is on our doorstep, for example. We've got local authorities not a million miles away. So these staff are going to, to leave us. So um, as far as you, you were concerned, is there anything going to be done to review posts like this and look at the salary levels? I think we've got a... a um a job um evaluate the jobs really um councillor jones yes i, I think that's, that's that's the only way we're going to do it because i th i'm not 100 percent sure but i think neighboring authorities are, are paying slightly slightly higher rates than us what, what i'm saying uh chris is that is that a matter that hr are dealing with between with yourselves because quite clearly you're quite right um, you know, the jobs need to be evaluated and clearly if people are coming in and they're only there for a short while and disappearing, we've got a problem. Yeah, not at the moment. We're not having dealt with it at HR at the moment. Um, obviously, as I, I'm new into, as you said, new yeah. into the post and we've had a yeah. pandemic yeah. since March, it just hasn't helped. No, no, exactly. And that's why I said I know you're new to the post. Um, but is that something that you and, um, and others will be pursuing with HR? Yeah, we're going to try and look at it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Staying on the same page, um, and again, um, you 5.3, you refer to the, the lack of IT software, um, and it, you, I quote, has meant the department has been unable to work as efficiently or effectively as possible. Now you've identified that as, as an issue um, and I go down to 6.3 where it's referred to the department still remains short staffed but a recent exercise identified a lack of IT software and staff shortage and you go on to say we are now able to recruit a new mechanical compliance officer as well as purchasing new IT software. Obviously, I would have thought you need that IT software ASAP in this digital age. That's going to help you considerably. So has the IT software been ordered? If it has, when when you expected it uh, to come in and work in? And has the new mechanical compliance officer uh, post been advertised? And if it has, when does that person start? Right. The mechanical compliance officer, firstly, we've, we sent the, the monitorium up. We wait in. I think it's got to go to council as part of the capacity exercise or cabinet as part of the capacity exercise to approve the, the, the post. Uh, the Ramis software we've we've had. So we, we've had that's 6.4. So that was new IT software. So the new risk assessment software. That was the biggest piece of software we needed. We've, we've, we've got that, we're implementing it, we're in the, well, we've just finished uploading all the information onto this software now, so, so that one piece of software can do all our, well, all our compliance 
reporting is on that one piece of software, which is, is a lot easier. So we can, we can run reports of software, things like that. That's good. And the other piece of software we are looking at is the MBS National Building Services software. And I was speaking to them this week on that, ordering that this week. So that should be in place soon. That's great. Uh, and uh, through you, Chair, that's good to know that uh, that will be up and working very shortly. Um, as far as the mechanical compliance officer is concerned, because clearly we've identified there's a need for that. Um, as you know, um, there is a capacity issue in the authority, which has been identified by the Improvement and Assurance Board um, a while ago when they first came in. Um, I've separately, I've asked in the authority, uh, I know some of these posts, not just in your department, but elsewhere, some have been filled. Um, I believe others are still vacant. And I, I have asked for a complete list of where the posts have been filled and where the vacancies still are. But in your answer, you're saying that this has got to go to cabinet and elsewhere. Um, I, think, I think it's just got to go through the, the approved to spend on it, uh, Councillor Jones. So I that's... Think, yeah, that's, it's been, that's, it's been that's, approved. That's, the post has been approved. It's just the spend. That's an internal matter. Um, and perhaps I could ask um, the Chief Officer um, if I could ask as to where we are with that then? Yeah, the post was approved by um, CMT uh, and as part of the capacity exercise, Steve Jones is just reviewing the finances attributed to that. So the, the post would be being advertised, no doubt, by the end of this week. That's the, I think is the answer we're looking for. Thank you. I'm still on the same page on the 6.2, which is above it. Um, you refer to the fact that you're unable to recruit a project manager, team leader. We've been able to rec recruit two new project managers through agency services to assist with the delivery of the capital programme. I presume that you couldn't um, recruit a project manage manager, team leader. Uh, is that because we've tried and the salary levels are at the level that are not attracting um, individuals? Yeah, we, we tried and there was nothing really compatible that came came out of it. So what we did then, we, we recruited two project managers to help with the workload on the, the capital projects, knowing that we can also charge these individuals to the capital programmes they're working on. Yeah. So is it is it a fact then that you, you've tried recruiting, that's been advertised, no takers, is that because the salary levels was inadequate enough to attract any, any good recruits? It, it could well be. Uh, this is, it could well be. It's usually the case if you advertise yeah. a post yeah. and nobody applies. Usually, there's only one reason why you don't get applicants. But following that, if you engage two new project managers through agency services, I, is the cost of employing two new project managers on agency dearer or cheaper than a project manager team leader? Um, we, we, to go through agency, we pay higher rates than, uh, than we pay, should we say. So yeah, they, they get, they command more money, but then they're self-employed working through an agency. So are we not paying any of the beyond cost to them? So no, for, I, for, for, yeah. an agent, for an agency staff, um, for one of the agency staff, I'm paying £32, I think it's £32.90 per hour. Um, so for two, for the one and a half, for the one who's working two and a half days again, same price, and then slightly less for the third full time when I just employed in December, paying about... 20, 20 odd pound an hour for, for him. Yeah. Um, and I know there's no on cost, but the issues you normally get with engaging the agency staff is they're not permanent staff. They got no loyalty to this authority. And at any one time, they can disappear and apply for a post elsewhere. Um, 
And couldn't it be a situation where it would be obviously better if you had a full-time project manager, team leader, because you've got sustainability there, but having two from the agency, um, I don't know how long they've been there, but is not likely to cause uh, some difficulties and increase the cost to the authority? It, it, it won't cost, it's not costing the authorities much. As I said, they, they charge directly to the capital programme they're working on. So it's usually 21st century schools. So they fund it through that. If I if I got a project manager through a team leader, then that would cost the authority. Obviously, that's the cost to the authority, but we have got the vacant post for that one in, in the structure. Mm. That's on a scale eight. So whether a scale eight enough to recruit that person, yeah, capable person, yeah, that was probably the question. Obviously, I, I you know it's got to be financed somewhere. If it's taken out of the capital program, that's that's one thing, but that's eating into the capital program for however long um, you you employ them. Yeah. But they're employed directly on that capital program then and it was also um, highlighted by Welsh government that they that we needed additional support for the for especially for the 21st century schools capital oh, program. I, I, I have no doubt but the project manager team leader um, would surely would that person only be engaged on 21st century schools no that person no that person would be engaged up there yeah. So obviously it's of benefit to have somebody there on a permanent basis, a full timer, because you've got real control over that ind individual on a whole scale of um, responsibilities. Yeah, totally agree. Clive, I think Chief Officer uh, Judith Jones wants to come in on this as well. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I, I totally appreciate Councillor Jones's point that, um, you know, to get a permanent um, officer in place is, is perhaps the ideal in most circumstances. I think, however, it is worth noting that um, professional QSs, particularly in this region, a lot of them do prefer to operate on uh, agency basis because obviously, you know, it, it gives them um, you know that control. We've been particularly lucky in some of the agency staff that we have that they have considerable experience in areas such as 21st century schools from working in a number of authorities in the region. So you know we are benefiting from that knowledge and experience. So whilst permanent staff you'd normally think are always the best option, sometimes there are benefits to having agency staff and I think the complement of um, agency staff that Chris has managed to recruit at the moment are serving us very well. Yeah, I, un I understand that uh, point of view, uh, Judith, but um, I know of uh, QSs employed um, previously who served the authority well with their knowledge and experience, and there is a value to having a permanent member of staff, um, you know, as, as part, because QSs, if they're engaged through an agency, as I previously pointed out, they're labelled to go at any time because that there is nothing, um, you know, to there to, re, to do in, uh, retain them for every other day because they could be working on this. A post comes along, which is perhaps a permanent post in authority or, 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 or private. Um, companies and they could be off. I, I mean, I don't know how long these two um, part-timers have been there. So, well, I employed the one last January, so he's, he's still with us. He started us yeah, this, this time last year and we've, we've only just started the other one. He, he started with us but just before Christmas. But both working through the agency have got to give a month's notice before they can leave us, which is is, is basically the same as what an employee can give anyway. Yeah. Now, Jay, can I refer to 5.4, still on page 15, and that's uh, connected up with 6.5 lower down. 
Um, and this, in my view, is a matter that really needs to be addressed by this authority. Um, the lack of condition surveys in the authority's portfolio meant we are unable to prioritize planned maintenance projects. Um, now, as an authority, everywhere, we need to have a planned maintenance uh, program. Um, and you clearly have to undertake surveys to ensure that these um, planned maintenance projects are, are accurate. And if you look at 6.5, you say you're putting in a program to place to undertake condition surveys of the authority's building for, for, portfolio, which I presume we haven't got at the moment. And clearly, as you say, it feeds into the maintenance strategy and program. But here are the key words. This is subject to obtaining appropriate budgets. So uh, can I ask, Chris, what, how much we're talking about? Um, have you applied uh, for this to be part of the budget? And what was the answer? Uh, I believe it's going to council on February the 3rd. Right. The budget. But no, we'll be working with the states. Are you talking about a budget for, for this particular issue? Yeah, for this issue. So there'll be a report going to full council, is that correct? Um, I th oh, it's in budget board. It's not coming through through us. It's coming through the education department because it's, it's their building. So it'll be coming through Anthony Lewis, the, the report, well, or the, the, the funding regime, well. I think it's, it's gone into the, the medium term financial plan. So. Right. I, I just I just try to find out what this amount of budget is and, it's, and where it will where it will surface and who's going to agree to it because there's got to be a yes or no at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I can't answer. Sorry. Can Judith answer that point? Yeah, I was just trying to look for the figures. To be honest, like it's, it's coming in as um, is, is a request coming from Education for Growth. Um, the, I understand the figure has been amended, and I think it's in the in the region of thirty thousand pound a year. Right, and that would be part of the um, education department's budget. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So, am I right in saying that um, the cabinet member of education and the chief officer and other staffs have? have I've got to agree to it, or they're in the process of agreeing to it. In the process of, yeah. Is it, is it, this is Clive, I can answer. This is going to be part of the discussion on the budgetary things that we be having the workshop on. On Thursday. So you'll be you'll be discussing them in that uh, budget forum that we have in February. I we don't. Is there a date being determined for the workshop? Thursday, Clive. Thursday. This Thursday, four o'clock. Right. I haven't. When, when did that come out? Oh, last week or the week before, I think. Discussing budgets. I believe uh, Steve Jones sent you the email. Yeah, we, well, between myself and Councillor Tanya, we've, um, there were two dates given to us. Um, one I couldn't uh, attend because I have a, a school governing body at exactly the same time. And we've asked for the meeting at five o'clock. And that was being left with Tanya to confirm whether she was available. And I haven't had anything since. I think we can take that up with Steve. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, really I, I am. I'm just saying. Yeah. I, I am got, um, you're saying this this Thursday. Yeah. I haven't got that down in my in my diary. We talk about the workshop. Yeah. Clive, any more questions? Um, I don't think so for the time being. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, anybody else got any questions? No. Any any comments? Clive. Well, well, I obviously, you know, we do need to see the whole structure here so that we got a good idea as to who's who and where the problem issues are, where the, where the, where the problems are. Um, and I for one would uh, clearly want to 
see that. Um, I well, I should have asked this, but um, the, the assistance you get from Plain of Gwent, uh, is that considerable? Yeah, they, they help us on the architectural side mainly, but they do give us um, support with um, health and safety, clerk of works, and also QSA. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else got any questions? Uh, we'll go on to the cabinet member first and then uh, Malcolm. Yeah, I just as a simple time, it's quite common to work across authorities. Like we do a lot of work in SABs for the Prime Gwent. So we do work for them and they do work for us. So it's not, the, it's not unusual for that to happen. Okay, Malcolm. Yeah, just to clarify for, for Clive, the email invitation came from Steve Jones on the 12th of January for the workshop. Right, okay, I'll look further into that. Anybody else? Okay, I, I'd just like to thank Chris uh, for his very detailed report. Uh, to be honest, I got lost a little bit as well. It's, uh, it was quite a lot to take in. Um, uh, obviously, you've got sh uh, staff shortages. Um, but your department also saves the council money and it's got the potential to save it, save us a lot more money as well by reducing carbon emissions and uh, and putting things in place in the council buildings as well. So good luck and uh, thank you very much. Oh, Judith. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Simon, just wanted to come in there to say that the, um, the staff shortages within Chris's area were highlighted as part of the capacity exercise and, yeah. you know, are now being addressed. So, you know, aside from the uh, the one post that Chris has mentioned, you know, we are nearly up to full complement there. So just to give that certainty, really. Yeah. Thank you, Judith. OK, uh, thank you very much, Chris. You can, you can go now. Uh, okay. One second now. Let's find where I am. OK, we're going to go on to item agenda number five. It's the dog fouling public spaces protection order. Um, I've got to thank uh, again, uh, Councillor David Hughes, uh, the Cabinet Member, and Chief Officer uh, Judith for bringing this to, um, to the, the Neighbourhood Services uh, Scrutiny Committee as well. Um, and Simon, I think you're going to um, you're going to present it. I, I don't know if you need to go uh, go through it, to be honest. I think members will have read it. Uh, and to save time, if, if we want to go straight into questions, unless there's anything you, you want to uh, to add, add first. Nothing to add, uh, Chair. I think, that, I think the report's quite straightforward, not too yes. complicated. Um, just over to questions, really. Okay. Uh, right, the change of our sequence now. Uh, questions first from uh, Councillor Colburn. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, this afternoon we're dealing with the two things that I'm sure affect most of us as councillors, fly tipping and dog fouling are the two things that I spend most of my time dealing with. Um, so I'm really pleased to see this coming forward. Just wanted to give us an indication of the time frame it's likely to be. Um, obviously looking at the responses to the consultation, a large percentage come from the south of the borough so it's, you know, it's a big issue and a big concern here, as I'm sure it is with other uh, councillors as well. It is, uh, Councillor Colbrand. I think the very fact that we had 817 responses to our consultation says a lot, you know. I think um, when we put this up, there was, it's no surprise that this is something that's uh, attracted the public's attention. You can see from those 817 responses, there are a lot from the bottom of the valley, but they're everywhere as well. You know what I mean? They're, they're at the top, they're in the middle. So there's clearly a problem. The reason we asked the questions we did in the consultation <clears throat> is to comply with what we've got to comply with in the Act. Now, the Act says that before we can make a PSPO, we've got to satisfy ourselves of a number of things. And the first one is that the activities carried on in the public place, i.e. dog fouling, um, has had a detrimental effect upon the quality of life of those in the locality. So those who responded, um, 817, I think 96% of them said that it's had a detrimental effect upon the quality of their life. And again, that's, that's no massive surprise to any of us. Is there? I think as, as ward councillors, you will have known that people complain about this 
and they expect the council to do something about it. The problem we always had is we didn't have the legislation to deal with it. Now, a little bit, a little bit of background. When I first started with the council um, in 2001, Dog Fowling was governed by the Dogs Fowling and Land Act in 1996. We had uh, that uh, dealt with by Dave Dyer in public health. He had Ken Weber, the dog warden, uh, out and about the streets of Merthyr Tidville following dogs. Um, if he saw a dog defecate, he would um, follow that dog back to the dog owner's house. He'd speak to them on the doorstep and um, we had a few prosecutions, uh, not, not, not a load, because obviously <laughs> that's very time consuming to spend your afternoon following a dog around uh, the streets of Merthyr Tidville. Anyway, so that's the situation when I first came here. I say we probably in about a five year period, we did about five prosecutions. Um, and then that legislation was um, repealed and uh, dog fighting was covered by the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act, uh, 2005. Um, again, similar legislation made it an offence nationwide for a dog uh, to foul and, not, and the owner not to pick up after it. That was um, superseded then by PSPOs, which came in in 2014. Now, what that said was it's up to each individual council to make these orders um, dealing with dog fouling. And um, up until now, we, we've never got around to it. Now, that does sound bad, but in, pre in preparation for this uh, meeting, I had a little look on, um, online. And I found a, um, a report on Wales Online, 11th of October 2018. So it's only two years ago. And of all the councils in Wales, at that time, there was only about three that had this PSPO in place. I think it was RCT, Caerphilly, and one other, I can't remember now. But in the meantime, in those two years, I can see that lots of other councils now have begun to do what we are doing. I still think the vast majority haven't got this in place. And it's a, and it's a case of getting around to doing it. Now, I think the catalyst year was, um, I was um, advising Gemma and Paul in relation to um, an issue that Councillor Gareth Lewis had last year where um, there was a significant problem where he was and I think he was getting a lot of pressure from a, um, a constituent and unfortunately we didn't have any legislation in place to tackle it and we were looking to try and tackle it by other means like trying to st stick a, a square peg in a round hole and it didn't seem right so we had a meeting uh, as officers and said, look, let's, let's get the legislation in place. Because you'll see from my report, there's no mention of who's going to enforce this. We know that. But I think the issue here is, let's get the legislation in, in place. We, we, you all know that this is a problem, county borough wide. You know this ha having a detrimental effect upon people's lives. And previously, there was uh, legislation in place to combat this. It, it, it's a little bit of a an anomaly in some respects. So that's the reason for it, and that's the reason for the questions that we've posed. Going on to what I was saying there, so first of all, we have to show this had a detrimental effect upon people's lives. Yes, clearly it has. The second condition is that it's persistent or continuing. Of course it is. Um, and then, uh, are the activities unreasonable? Well, letting your dog defecate and not pick up, you know, I mean, by its very nature, I think is unreasonable. And then the third thing we gotta look at is, is what we're planning to do, i.e., make it an offence not to pick up from your dog, uh, a reasonable restriction uh, to impose. Well, on the basis that previously all the legislation that governed the whole of the UK made that condition, I would suggest that it probably is. So basically that's, that's, that's where we're at. I'm sorry, Martin, I forgot the original question you asked. <laughs> uh, what was the time frame we were looking at? <laughs> yeah, time frame. Well, we're almost there. You know, my plan was initially to put this to a uh, cabinet either in uh, January or even December, but obviously uh, you wanted it to come to, um, to scrutiny. If, um, if all goes to plan, then I, I can finish this report off to cabinet um, tomorrow. I can do that. The report to cabinet is going to be very similar to the report that you're looking at today. The, the results of the consultation will be in it, etc. And if Cabinet uh, are minded to, to deal with it on the, I think it's the 3rd of February or the 4th, um, we can make the order then. Now, what happens then is um, we have to go through a consultation process, not consultation, sorry, a publication process. 
And what the Act says, we're going to publish, um, so let's, say, let's, let's jump to the, the 4th or the 3rd of February and Cabinet say, yeah, we're going to make this uh, PSPO. We have to publish it on the website. Uh, what I suggest we do as well then is um, do a regular social media campaign. So once a month on Twitter, on Facebook, just reminding the public this is in force, okay? Because what the Act says is we should be putting up signage. Now, for a county borough-wide exercise, that's, that's not practical to, to put it everywhere. So what, I'm, what I would suggest is that we would do a regular campaign for a year, every month telling people this is in force, but then put signage on hotspot areas like parks, like cemeteries, um, and then that will draw people's attention to it as well. So the, the, the time scales are, um, if, we, if we go for the 4th of February, um, I'll be looking to um, put the PSPO in force around about the 3rd of uh, March. And then once that's, once that's in place, um, the public have six weeks to contest it if they think, if, they, if, if they're minded to. But, it, but in effect, uh, Malcolm, we can, we can get this done very, very quickly now. The consultation bit took, took the time because it's standard requirement and we went for the full 12 week consultation. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think there's a culture in some of the outlying villages in particular where people let their dogs out in the morning and let them wander around all day. And I think that's something perhaps we've got to change. And my own particular personal bugbear is when people do clean up after their dogs, put it in a plastic bag and hang it from the nearest tree. Yeah, yeah I think that's very often people do that when they're expecting to come back the same way as they, they left. And um, Yeah, I don't think that's always again. the case. Maybe, maybe <laughs> sometimes, always. sometimes it is, but not yeah. always. Yeah. Okay. Malcolm, any more? Really? Yeah, no, that was it from me. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, Clive? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just a clarification um, under D on page six. And you're talking about the council publishing the PSBO, this website. Yeah. And then cause to be erected on adjacent to the public base to which the order relates such notice as it considers sufficient to draw the attention of any member but using that space to the fact that a PSPO has been made. Um, do, you, do you mean, because talking about hotspots, they're everywhere. Mm. I mean, okay. one of the places is, you know, two favourite places are the pavements um, and I agree with the comments coming back from the 800 odd uh, is no surprise to any councillor. I mean, crikey Moses. And we've come across it ourselves, you know. Um, those who have children or, or grandchildren, um, they don't always see what they should see on the pavement. And before you know it, it's on the underside of, the, of their feet. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a real issue but and the back lanes at another place where they try and take them the culprits in sometimes late at night in the early hours of the morning and nobody sees it so you know we're on the back lane which are usually unlit so do you are you talking about putting notices in back lanes and places like that because there's hundreds of them that's why I said that we, I think we'd have to limit the number of places we put these um, from, from a cost perspective, you know. Um, and, and that's why it's important for a regular social media campaign. Even if we, I, I said do it for a year, these things last for three years, okay, and they can be renewed. This, this one, if we, if we make this on the, on the 4th or the 3rd of February, I would envisage that every three years we look to renew this. So I think... Because it's not practical to put a sign on every back lane, we got to make it clear to everybody with some other method, and that would be, in my view, Facebook and Twitter, um, and signage where, you know, I mean, if, if there's a particular problem that you, you know in an area, maybe we could, we could look to put signage. But that's not a matter for, for me so much. That would be for the enforcing department, I think, to determine that. 
Um, and one other question, if this, if you've got more challenges to it, um, it says in here that, the, uh, that this could be in operation by the 21st of April, mm -hmm. if there's no challenges to it. So if someone identifies an area and they've uh, witness, there's witnesses to this happening, does that mean that they can use this legislation in case of a potential prosecution? Yeah, that's the difficulty, isn't it, trying to enforce this. It's, it's all well and good putting it in. And if you look at a lot of the uh, responses we had is, how on earth are you going to catch, catch dogs doing this with their owners present? Who's, who is who is going to catch it? Um, in relation to having um, somebody come to us and say, I saw Mr. X with his dog uh, defecate, he didn't pick it up, then yeah, I think we'd have to look at that because we want the, the public to, to come forward and to help us because we, we, as it stands, you know, I mean, maybe the default option would be for Gemma and Paul to be looking at this, but you can see from the, 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 the presentation they give, you know, I mean, they haven't got the time to be to spending any time on this. So, you know, it's just a far bigger question. But going back to your question, from the date that uh, um, we look to put it in place, after six weeks, we can start prosecuting if somebody comes forward and says, and they're prepared to give a witness statement, we judge each case on its own merits, we'd have to look to see whether there's any, any issue, you know, we need to be sure that this person would come to court, because they'd have to come to court, and that's the issue, and we don't, we don't like doing that, we'd much rather have a council official come to court because number one you can't say well you know I mean you made that up because you don't like me because you, you don't know what what the situation would be with somebody who's reporting somebody you just don't know we'd have to take each case in its own merits but technically we can crack on and start enforcing this from the date you mentioned uh, you know I think we all welcome this uh, but it's it's the question uh, as you've just referred to of clearly enforcing this yeah it's, you know enforcement in my view is the answer mm. and enforcing this means for them to get the message you've got to go to court mm. and the more cases that go to court the more this message will, and it's it is a, a small number of uh, dog owners but they cause the worst problem they cause the worst problems ev everywhere um, and it's just getting these identifying, getting the evidence, getting the witness statements, um, you know, to, to get the successful prosecution. It is. Um, you see that we're looking for t um, two um, restrictions, um, and that is when a dog defecates, somebody's got to pick up after it and dispose of it. And secondly, that um, there's... Um, a requirement that somebody who's in control of a dog that they have the means to um, to pick up after them. Now, you know, these are things a cabinet are going to have to look at whether they want both of those uh, in. Um, I can see that RCT have got both of those conditions in theirs. Torvine, for instance, have only got the one about the dog defecating and it's an offence not to pick up after it. Um, there's also the uh, question I asked: Should there be any exemptions? Um, there were lots. There were lots of responses to that, but the main one was um, dogs uh, for the blind, uh, people who are disabled, or any other reasonable cause. But a reasonable cause is not that you haven't got a bag with you, right? I think that will be set out. But that 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 can't be reasonable. You have to leave for your walk with a bag. But um, it may well be the, the sensible option here is, and I can see what Kafili and RCT have done. The exemptions they have. Let me have a look. Uh, it's for uh, somebody who's uh, registered as partially sighted or blind, uh, somebody with a disability that affects their mobility, um, and some other disability that cannot reasonably be expected to remove feces, and um, working dogs. Um, so we, we, we can look to see including that in two hours as well, because I think that would be a reasonable um, sort of exemption to, to, to apply. Thank you. Five any more? Uh, no, I don't think so, Chair. Thanks. Hey, uh, Councillor David Jones. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Simon, why is it okay for um, this to be?
promoted on social media when things like the fly tipping notices have to be on site and within the reasonable distance of the uh, potential offence? No, I think the reason we put the fly tipping signs up is to say that you may be on camera. That's my understanding. What we put up is that this is a fly uh, tipping area. Um, it, it's against the law and you may be recorded. That's the reason we put the signs up as far as I'm aware. This is just to let the public know that this is, things have changed in Merthyr, that there is now a law in place to make sure that you pick up after your dog. But let's be honest, uh, Dave, most normal people, sensible people do it in any event. You know, I think people, some people will be surprised there isn't a law in place. But that's why I'm saying we, we, we publicise it on, uh, on, on social media, just to, for the drip feed to say things have changed in Merthyr. You will get prosecuted if you found to let your dog defecate. Yeah, and, and I agree with what you're saying. I think a lot of these people, or there'll be a lot of crossover between these people and the fly tip, as in my opinion. Mm. Well, you're right. Um, I live in Powys, and um, you know, I mean, technically, I can I, I can let what what, uh, what Malcolm was saying. I could open the door. I got two dogs. I could, I could let them out, and I won't get prosecuted in Powys. But most people wouldn't know that in Powys. People assume that it is the law that you pick up after your dog. You know. And it should be, and it was the law. It's just the fact that you've got to make it the law, and that's what we're trying to do now. Yeah, okay, thank you, Simon. Okay, anybody ask any questions? Simon, I've I've got a question. It's it's something that came up uh, uh, following a consultation, and it's mentioned in um, some of the uh, some of the comments made by uh, by by residents, and it's about dogs on sports pitches. Mm. Um, now, unfortunately, dogs are brought onto sports pitches. They do their business on them. Um, some residents would pick up after them, some won't. But obviously, the re even if it's picked up, the residue is still there, which can last for quite a while. Um, and there was, I think, a recent case last year or the year before in Wales where a rugby player had an open cut on, on their leg. The dog feces went into it and it was he nearly had to have it amputated now i'm wondering would would if you were to bring something like that forward would that have to go out to a uh, to a, another consultation or could it be a recommendation maybe we could ask the cabinet to to look at that when, when they make their report or no. when, when, they, when they decide sadly chair we'd have to go for, for further consultation the reason we didn't include that with this report was <laughs> Um, I think we all agree this is a bit of a no-brainer. Um, dogs on leads, dogs out of parks, not so much dogs on sports fields. Because I think again, that's that's another one that is pretty much common sense. But I think it's something we can easily attach to this one. Uh, we'd have to go for a second set of consultation. We'd have to have, we'd have to set out. This, is, this was easy in some respects because this is borough wide. I don't have to, I don't have to set out exactly where we're going. We're saying it's everywhere. Now, if we were to do dogs on parks, sporting fields, we'd have to have some, some maps to show us where these fields are. So there's a little bit more work involved, um, but it's, it's, it's a relatively easy uh, thing to do. And, and I don't think that would be too controversial in any event. Dogs on leads is another matter of mine, because I, I think lots of councils have tried this in the past and they have felt the sort of the weight of people who think that some dogs should be off leads as well. So. Um, open to adding to this but I don't we can't do it this time because we didn't consult on it okay but but it's I think what your the point you make with dogs on sports fields yeah let, let, let's get some plans let's get some sports fields drawn up and uh, we can do it okay before I bring Malcolm Corbin in I also had another one which is you kind of slightly mentioned as well we've also had uh, a lot of residents come about asking if dogs could be kept on a lead in a cemetery. Obviously not to keep dogs out of the cemetery because they are after all man's best friend. Mm. Um, but obviously going by your answers this would have to go through a, a further consultation as well. No not that, that doesn't because the cemeteries are our land we own them. We, we, we can make our own rules up for our land but again I think that there is a, 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 quite a large section of society who will say my dog is well behaved I pick up after my dog. Why can't I let my dog off the lead in, in a cemetery? So I think there is an issue there. Uh, that's a political issue, but we don't have to go to consultation for that. If it's our land, we can do what we want, providing it's reasonable. Okay, thank you, Simon. Uh, Malcolm, 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, going back to the um, dogs on sports fields thing, didn't Cardiff try this a couple of years ago, banning dogs from sports field? They ended up with a huge backlash and had to uh, backtrack on the policy in a very short time. I, I don't know specifically about Cardiff, but I know that you do get, there are issues uh, with, with, with that. that. There's an element of the public who will say it's, re it's reasonable to do that. The dog fouling, there was, there was nobody that said it, it's re the, only, the, only, the only one I saw, there should be designated dog fouling fields. I think, my God, can you imagine going to a dog fouling field where every dog in the, <laughs> in the borough goes? <laughs> so I don't think that's, and, and they were saying maybe you should make it that um, it doesn't apply off the beaten track. Well, that's, that, that, I, 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 I see, I see uh, sense in that, but that would come into us being sensible in our enforcement. So you, if you're up in the woods somewhere and your dog is off the lead and it goes in the woods, number one, you're not going to be seen. Number two, if you came to me as a prosecutor and said that I saw a dog defecate in, in the woods or in the brambles, is it in the public interest? Because every prosecution has to pass two tests. Number one, the evidential test. So you've got somebody who says, yeah, I saw it happen. Look at that, the PSPO, yeah, it's an offence. Is it in the public interest? So I think it allows us as officers to use common sense as well. And um, I think, you know, I mean, um, you mentioned it in Paul and Gemma's uh, presentation. We got a very good reputation over in the Magistrates Court as, as only bringing sensible prosecutions. They, they do have a lot of time for us. We don't put, put silly ones before. I've only had other councillors, but I'm often over there with other councillors. And sometimes the magistrates are rolling their eyes at the things that they bring for waste and, and the likes. We haven't got that. We haven't got that reputation. I don't want to have that reputation over there, to be honest with you. I think it's, it's, it's good. So, yeah, um, it does allow us this uh, little bit of leeway to, to have common sense. So I wouldn't recommend that we, we exclude any area from this because we have to signpost it as well to say you're now leaving it the designated area. More signs. Uh, it's far better to say, look, everywhere applies and we we'll use common sense. I'd just like to come in on that one as well. I wouldn't go advocating that uh, we say we wouldn't prosecute uh, people, owners, for leaving their dogs into a, into a forest or wooded area because the dog poop will have, um, will change the, uh, the nature of, of the floor um, because obviously you've got animals, invertebrates uh, and bugs using, uh, eaten off the eaten off the ground there and uh, it has the, 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 the um, could have the consequence of changing the, the habitat. Um, anybody else got any questions? No? Um, one second, I think I've got a... Yeah, anyone got any comments? I, I have. It's just one. Um, it's Cl it was what Clive brought brought up, and it was a question I was going to ask, and it was about the um, how do we police this? And obviously, it's going to be difficult. But as Simon said, the vast majority of, of residents are law abiding. Um, you know, they don't want to go upsetting their, their fellow residents. Um, but I'm just wondering if we can. Um, over the 12 months that you, you put the literature up, you put it on the, web, uh, on the website, on Facebook and that sort of thing, that you tell people there is that option that if they want to upload um, uh, video evidence, I think if that option could be there, it, it might make it easier for people to, to uh, where they might be afraid, otherwise it's just go and, go and say it, but if, they, if the video evidence is there, and um, it clearly shows someone letting their dog defecate without them picking it up. I think maybe if you have those kind of options, it's, it's definitely something, something to think about. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, uh, thank you very much again for, for uh, letting us um, discuss this topic at, uh, at the Neighbourhood Services Scrutiny. Anybody else? Okay, Simon, thank you very much. Um, let's go back onto the, uh, onto the agenda. I think all officers I can I think can leave now, um, unless we need any to uh, to stay in. Maria. Yeah, happy to stay, Chair. Okay, um, right. That's it. That's it for them. Um, agenda item number seven. Forward work program. Um, I've had. Uh, I was in conversation with Councillor Lee Davis, and I think all councillors will have will have had um, something through the post, and it was about um, nappy recycling. Um, 
I think it, I've, I've been contacted by a resident last year. It wasn't about nappy recycling. It was more about um, use, reusable nappies. But I think it's something that if I put an email together um, with some members, if they want to come in, in on it, I think it's definitely something that we can we can look at. I did email the company that sent out the, uh, the little calendar, desk calendar, that I think probably everyone got, but I haven't had a reply yet. But... Um, I, I think it's definitely something that we could put on the uh, agenda for the future. Uh, Clive, do you want to come in? Yeah, I agree. You've got Clive, to mute, I'll come mute again. God, sorry. <laughs> I, I agree that we definitely need to uh, discuss this one. Um, I note from the um, email that came out that it'll be a another few years before um, you know we can do anything about this um you know the, the the amount of soiled nappies and incontinent pads etc that's put out in it's it's an enormous amount and in this day and age we sh we should not be doing it frankly so I, I think we need to put that in the forward work plan um, you know and discuss that um as soon as we can. The reason I put my hand up, uh, Chair, is that the items that were due on in, in the December meeting, and there's there were at least two, the energy saving, carbon management, and community asset transfer policy. Where where is that going to go now in the uh, in the program? Just looking now, I, I think I did uh, speak to Sean about it uh, a little while ago. Oh, was it Maria? I, I can't remember. My, my memory's terrible. But I think we have got room um, coming up towards the end of the year if we, if we want to slot it in. Yeah, Chair, looking at the agenda for the 1st of March, it looks like you've only got one full report in there, yeah. and that's around the Nature Recovery Action Plan. So you could certainly add in, if it was only one of the two uh, Cali Forbes items into there, um, there's certainly room to accommodate that in your next shared meeting, the 1st of March meeting. Um, and following on from that then, it appears to me that there could be space on the 12th of April, which is your last meeting of this year. So it's up to committee members really. They can either take the, the two outstanding items from December. So you've got three items at the next meeting. Those three items would be community asset transfer policy, the energy saving and carbon management, and the actual item which was scheduled for that date, which is the Nature Recovery Action Plan. If you feel that that's manageable as agenda, I'm happy to make that adjustment for you. And I can obviously go out to uh, the officers who will be producing the reports then um, to inform them that that's the case and ask them to submit it in time to make sure that you've got the report as required. So, Maria, I, I, sorry, I'm, I'm happy for uh, the two we've missed in December to be put on to our March. I think one of them may, uh, may actually uh, work alongside the nature action the Nature Recovery Action Plan anyway. Um, and if we look looking at um, recycled nappies, if I put something together exactly what I was thinking we'd need, if I pass it around to the members, uh, um, the other members of, of, of the committee, and if they want to add anything in, then I pro probably will have forgotten. Um, and th uh, um, then we could bring that one then to, uh, to the April uh, committee, if everyone's in agreement. Chair, I, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and, you know, all right, it's taken a bit longer this afternoon, but we've covered at least three items uh, this afternoon, so I've no doubt it's doable in, in March. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. I'll make the necessary adjustments and uh, wing it through uh, to you, Chair, just for you to have a, a scan, check you're comfortable with it, now that I know the committee are comfortable with it. Uh, and that being the case, I can go out ASAP then to the officers to give them plenty of time to draft the report. Well, on, on that score, um, the, the, the report should be ready because yeah. <laughs> you know, the two, they, yeah. they, they, they shouldn't be any argument saying they're not ready. Mm -hmm. They should have been ready 
because we called the, the meeting off and there was obviously a good reason for calling it off in mm. December. So, but they would have had these reports all done, ready, so they just, they're on the shelf. Yeah, certainly for the first two. Um, it, it, we'll, um, we'll double check what the status is with them. What I don't want to do is leave you at the deficit so there's a report missing because I haven't gone out to remind them. Um, right, agenda item number, number sorry, eight. Sorry, sorry uh, Mark. Yeah, sorry, Chair. It, well, Clive has made most of my points already um, about bringing those items forward. We've had three big items today, or two with, with the recycling and, and the fly tipping and whatever. So I, I certainly think the other reports aren't going to take up as much time as these. Um, with the NAPU recycling, yeah, thoroughly agree with that. I've, I've read the email with interest. And one of the big complaints I get about people wanting a, a bigger bin is that they have to put nappies and then consonants pads in their, in their black bin. So anything we can do to that will, will help another issue that we have as well. Matthew. Um, lovely. Um, agenda item number eight, scrutiny referrals, feedback and follow-up actions. I think, did we have, I can't remember so long ago now, we had a follow-up uh, follow action, didn't we, to uh, to recommend something? Or did we? I can't, I can't remember now. Not so far as I'm aware of, Jeff. Oh. Okay. It was just the voting on the... Um, uh, on the item, okay, that's all right. Um, reflection and evaluation of the meeting. Right, there was a little bit of confusion uh, in regards to timings. Um, Lee, I know you missed out, um, but we've had, um, I've had feedback from, uh, from Maria via the, um, uh, sorry, via the uh, Democratic Department that the meeting will go back to what we decided, quarter past four. And it's up to, uh, if the chief officer, if she can't make that meeting, she's got to, ha she's got to put someone forward to, to be able to answer the questions. So we go back to what was, uh, what was decided in, in the, uh, the last meeting or before. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, we're all taking meetings from home with children. I don't see why other people can't. So, yeah. 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 There we go. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else. Has anyone got anything else? So, yeah, Clive. Yeah. Whilst the pandemic is on, I mean, we're all in lockdown and abiding by the stay at home policy. Our next meeting's on the 1st of March. I mean, we might be in the same position. So I'm just wondering, for that particular meeting in March, whether we keep to the time we've had today. I mean, it's just it's just my view. It, it depends where we are and where the restrictions have been any been lifted. Yeah, I think yeah. I think what Anne said in Democratic is because we've actually spoken about this. Um, on, on numerous occasions, we've agreed at times, the times got changed on the website, that it should have stayed at that time today, um, that it was up to the officers to put someone, uh, the chief officer to put someone else forward if she couldn't make it. And it's uh, really put the onus on, on the chief officer to, uh, to be at the meeting. Oh, I, 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 agree, I, I agree with that. But what I'm saying is because of the lockdown, you know, I'm, you're up, if you're not working externally, you're already at, at home, aren't you, with, the, with, the, with an earlier meeting? But the, the, th the thing, the issue for me today was the, I had the corporate panel meeting um, at two o'clock. My wife was in work. The children were in school in the hub. Oh, right. I, could, I, I couldn't physically, I, they had to come out of school at half past one. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Uh, for me to have all the meetings as well. So, yeah, it was yeah. Fair enough, Lee. Okay, lovely. I, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, straight out of this meeting into another then. Okay. <laughs> Thank Enjoy. you very much, everyone. All the best now. Stay right, safe. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.